For those of you who haven't had a chance to look at the errata, um, we, uh, we have now, um, uh, Lord Nick's turn uh, was taken ill and he had to return from Mexico uh, back to London and uh, Professor Gus Peth, um, his, uh, he had a personal um, uh, problem because his wife fell ill and then he had to stay back in the US. Uh, but we have two absolutely wonderful speakers today who bring, uh, will, will bring a completely unique perspective uh, to this conference. Um, shall we go in this, you and him, or is there, do you have any, any preference for order? Yes. Um, uh, we have Mr. Nitin Desai um, with us and Mr. Francesco uh, Getani. Uh, and both of them, Mr. Desai, um, if I may introduce him, it's a bit of an echo. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, he played a key role. He's been on the issue of sustainable development from the time of the Brundtland Report, when we began to talk about sustainable development. Um, and he's therefore played a key role in an, on the issue of international politics and sustainable development for over two decades. He was senior economic advisor to the World Commission on Environment and Development, which we know as the Brundtland Report, and he drafted key chapters of the Commission's report, Our Common Future. And, and then subsequently, he was Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations Conference um, in Rio in 1992, and he coordinated the work of the Secretariat for Agenda 21. In 1993, he was also appointed Under Secretary General to head the UN's newly created Department for Policy Coordination and Sustainable Development. Uh, he was involved, in addition, on the, in the organization of the <coughs> Copenhagen Summit on Social Development in 1995 and the Monterey Summit on Finance and Development in 2002. He, he then acted as Secretary General to the World Summit of Sustainable Development at Johannesburg in 2002. Uh, he since retired from the UN, but not really retired, and he continued after that uh, his association with the UN as a special advisor to the Secretary General for the World Summit on the Information Society, and he chairs the advisory group that organizes the annual UN Internet Governance Forum. Um, he, he's uh, an honorary fellow of the London School of Economics. He's chairman of the Board of Governors of my institute, and he advises the Indian government on its National Climate Change Action Plan. Um, so um, with those words, uh, and then I will, um, in, let me also then introduce Mr. Francesco Gaetani. I hope I pronounced the correctly. He is executive secretary to the Ministry of Environment in Brazil, he received his degree in public administration from the London School of Economics, so that's something that the both of them share. Um, uh, and he served in the executive secretariat of the Brazilian Ministry of Planning, Budgeting and Management, as well as advisor to the UN represent resident representative and ambassador in Brazil. He was ge general coordinator of the UNDP program in Brazil. And in addition, uh, he has a strong interest in academics. He was active as director of the Government School of Minas Gerais and director of undergraduate studies of the National School of Public Administration. So both of them share a strong interest in ideas, but also a strong interest in action. So with those words, um, let's welcome them, folks. Dr. Agarwal, Dr. Gaitani, and friends, it's a pleasure for me to be here at the International Society of Environmental uh, Economics. My ecological. ecological economics. My apologies. People are very sensitive to the my, difference. My apologies. <laughs> this is what this is what comes with age, uh, and the uh, well, my connection with this was uh, first connection was 45 years ago. And uh, I really want to refer to that because of the memory of a friend from then who was one of the pioneers of uh, ecological economics, David Pierce. Uh, David Pierce and I were colleagues in Southampton 45 years ago. And uh, I was a person who was working on the theoretical side. I used to teach optimum growth theory, microeconomics, etc., etc. And I thought handling data was something which only lesser mortals did. But uh, David was the man who persuaded me that there's a lot there because he was at that time involved in the uh, work on Stansted Airport near London. Mm. 
and which was one of the early, where he did some of his pioneering work on uh, measuring ecological value in terms of amenity and uh, so on. And as you know, David became a very prominent uh, economist working in this area, and it's really, I wanted to just refer to him because he was a very dear friend, and he is no more with us, and I would like to dedicate what I have to say today to him. Uh, David and I, uh, well, I'm, uh, in a sense, we parted because he continued in the academic sphere. I left the academic sphere and was much more involved in the policy uh, area. Uh, the, as uh, been, I told you, I have been involved in sustainable development from around 85 when I joined the Brundtland Commission. Later, I, I, I was involved in the writing of the key chapters on sustainable development. I have a word to say on that. Later, the Rio conference, when I was the person in the secretariat who was organizing the substantive work and the negotiations, and Morris Strong was the person who was mobilizing political support from presidents, prime ministers, corporate leaders, non-governmental organizations, and so on. That was our division of labor. Both, both, both were very necessary, and in many ways, Morris's work was far more important because that, the politics of Rio is as important as the economics. Uh, later, I uh, ran the Commission on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg. But today, I'm really, uh, you know, what I'm going to give you is more a narrative. A narrative, a personal memoir. Uh, so in that sense, it's not uh, uh, m m interesting more as an insider's view of what happened. Uh, it's not analytical, so I apologize for that. But I left the world of academia about 40 years ago. So you'll have to forgive me for the fact that this is much more of a narrative than uh, that. I'm doing this because uh, I obviously had a ringside seat in all this, and I've received frequent requests from people saying, Mr. Desai, you must write down all your experiences of these great summits. And then they, some of them add after that, before it is too late. And uh, I sometimes wonder what they mean by that, you see. So uh, I thought, so before it is too late, let me at least put a few things down so that uh, it's there in case it does get too late. So uh, this is the, my main purpose in agreeing to this request from Bina that I should come and speak to you. Uh, if you see, uh, when I do so, I focus more on Brundtland and Rio because I believe these two had a significant impact on global policy. I wish I could say the same for the subsequent things I've been involved in, but I'm afraid I cannot. And I do want to focus on this. And one measure of the value of Agenda 21 is the opposition it still provokes in certain circles. And as recently as January 2012, the Republican National Committee passed a resolution denouncing Agenda 21 and describing it as a comprehensive plan of extreme environmentalism, social engineering, and global political control that considers the American way of life of private property ownership, single family homes, private car ownership, and individual travel choice, and privately owned farms all as destructive to the environment and that seeks to accomplish social justice by socialist, communist redistribution of wealth. We obviously, we got something right. If 20 years later, uh, the Republican National Committee has to pass a resolution like this, so for this is one reason why I wish to concentrate a bit on the politics of Brundtland and Agenda 21. Uh, I joined the Brundtland Commission in 1985, at a time when in the, within the commission there was an impasse an impasse between the commissioners who came from the environmental side and the commissioners who were more focused on uh, development. The environmental-oriented commissioners were focusing on issues of pollution, resource conservation, and the developmental people felt that what's happening to growth and development, what's happening to poverty in this uh, dialogue. And each side worried that the other side had a hidden uh, agenda. Uh, there was also actually a personality issue. The economist who was in charge was uh, somebody who came from the dependency school of Latin America, Vicente Sanchez. The secretary general was a former director of the pollution directorate of the OECD, 
Now, you can't imagine a cultural gulf created in that. You know? uh, on the one hand, I have uh, somebody who's been a pollution control man, and on the other hand, I have somebody who's a dependency theorist. So there was a total, total, absolute lack of communication. So they decided they would look for a person who had nothing to do with the environment, who had been involved in development, had some sensitivity, but who had not, was not an environmentalist, which is why they the choice descended finally on me. I will not go into why, etc. Those are personal details which are not terribly uh, uh, relevant. Uh, my, and my main contribution was in the uh, part on sustainable development. The way I got to that was that it was a very early meeting the meeting was actually organized to give me a sense of what the politics was, and the meeting involved three commissioners. Uh, Maurice Strong, who in a sense spoke, was the a much more sensitive voice of the environmental group. Sridhar Ramphal, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, who was uh, a very sensitive voice of the developmental group, and Janos Stanovnik, who was from Slovenia and was in a sense reflected the sort of in-between position of the Eastern Bloc and in those days. And they talked, and when I heard them, I felt that there was something that one could do, that there was enough common ground. And that's how sustain, the idea of sustainable development as a basis for the Bruntan Report was born. It's not a new concept. It was there with forestry and fisheries uh, in the form of sustained yield. It uh, was there in the World Conservation Strategy of 1980, move, but more from a conservation perspective. I think what Brundtland did was to frame the issue more as a broad-based developmental issue, not just as a conservation issue, but it's not a new concept. Nor was the issue of the link between environment and development and the need to explicate that new. You had the FUNE report, which was done in the preparation for the, Rio, for the uh, Stockholm conference in 72, which talked about it. You had the Kokoyok declaration. Uh, the Gokoyok Declaration was actually came from a joint meeting of UNEP and UNCTAD. And uh, in a sense, you could almost describe UNEP and UNCTAD as the trade unions of the two lobbies. You know? <laughs> so uh, the, the, they came together, and this, the Gokoyok Declaration is a product of that. Johan Daltung did the development side, Barbara Ward did the environmental side. But they did not talk of sustainable development. They were talking more in terms of connecting the two agendas, etc. So even that was not essentially new in the uh, Brundtland uh, Commission. Well, I must interrupt. I'm using an iPad. It's one is very interesting is my, uh, my screensaver and iPad happens to be my latest grandson. So it's very nice that when I talk of sustainable development, every now and then my grandson's face suddenly appears you see, and reminds me what I ought to be talking about, you see. Uh, the, so the the note on sustainable development I submitted is I actually have that original note and uh, with my marginal uh, comments uh, on it on the modifications the commissioners wanted. Uh, for those of you who are interested, if you give me your emails, I'll be happy to email it uh, to you. It's a piece of historical record. Some people call it the birth certificate of sustainable development and global diplomacy. If I look at the modifications the commissioners suggested, what I see is that essentially the the part which was not fully acceptable at that time was the idea of sustainable consumption. My original note had a phrase, had a sentence which said, sustainable development requires that the affluent everywhere aim at consumption standards which in time, if not immediately, can be reached by everyone and which are within the bounds of the ecological possible. My marginal comment against that is modify. Uh, it was not accepted. There are many reasons for it. One was, of course, the usual one from that you know, we don't have, we, we, we can do fix these things without looking at lifestyles. The other one was, came actually from people, some developing country people, saying what will happen to our primary commodity exports if you push this agenda. So this was one thing which was modified. And if you re see, compare this uh, original text with the revised, which is borrowed as the same. Partly it's the same because we, draftsmen know that after you have a discussion at a political level, you can by and large do what you like and nobody will notice that you left everything as it is, you see. So uh, you'll see there won't be too many changes between this and the uh, subsequent uh, uh, text, but there are. And essentially the, uh, there's a much more explicit uh, endorsement of the idea that growth is good, 
that growth does not have set, in fact, the phrase they use is growth does not have set limits in the uh, 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 run-run control. There was also in my note, you will see, there was a rather stark uh, reference to fertility control, and that is replaced by some politically more appropriate language in the uh, Brundtland uh, report. And the changes that they made are reflected in the qualif you know, in this sort of explanation of the famous definition. The famous definition is in the original note, meeting the needs of the president, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the, the qualification is a little different. You'll see that. And here they say. It, the definition contains within it two key concepts, the concept of needs, which is fine, and the idea of limitations imposed by the state of technology and social organization. The key there was the belief, don't talk of limits, talk of using technology and social organization to overcome limits. I'm stressing this because in some ways this was an important step in the evolution of this. Yes, we did succeed in getting consumption onto the agenda, but in a very, very weak and mild uh, uh, form. In many ways, sustainable development in the Brundtland Commission was a bridge concept. It was a concept which was meant to get the environment and developmental lobby talking to one another. And my problem with bridge concepts is that there's no sense of ownership. And it has always had this problem. It has always been looked at a uh, little suspiciously by environmentalists and often suspiciously, certainly by very growth-oriented development uh, economists. But it got the two sides talking. By the end of the commission, the people who came from the environmental side started using language like, we cannot solve the environmental problem unless we solve the debt problem. And people who came from the developmental side started talking language like, you cannot solve poverty unless you address resource management which was exactly what sustainable development was uh, meant to do. There's much more in the Brundtland than the definition. There's a much greater elaboration, the idea of strategic imperatives, which are, I won't go into. From a more specialized perspective, one could argue that it could be more rigorous. It could have been more rigorous about the issue of consumption over time. Uh, it's not entirely clear what is the constraint, what is it that you're talking of? Are you talking of ensuring that consumption never falls? Or are you talking of something like optimization over time? Uh, to some extent, because it was a popular document, this, these niceties of uh, intergenerational econo uh, analysis that economists would do is not adequately reflected. And the other area that I think is a little, could have been stronger, was the treatment of uncertainty. And how sustainability can be pursued when outcomes are not known for uh, certain. I think this is important. Because the asymmetry of effects, the fact that downside risks of not doing things are so much greater than any potential upside regret if you do something and you find that you didn't have to do it. You know? uh, so that aspect is not adequately reflected in uh, what is to some extent a certain slightly deterministic concept. Uh, from Brundtland, we move on to the Rio summit. The Rio summit, well, the General Assembly welcomes the resolution, decides to set up the summit. And if you see the, the debates which went on in the preparations of the resolution which set up the summit, 44228, uh, you will see that uh, the big issue for the developing countries was finance and technology transfer. Uh, they wanted that in. Uh, the USA and the OECD resisted, but they finally agreed. And the, incidentally, the country which played a very important mediating role there was Japan. It is Japan agreement between G77 and the uh, Europe and the U uh, USA to include this, uh, the, these, these elements. And Japan played a very positive role throughout the uh, uh, Rio process. There were other issues about look, where, the, where the PREPCOM would be located. Uh, there is a, the, the, the politics behind it was that the developing countries didn't want it located in UNEP because they felt it would then become an environmental conference. They wanted it in the General Assembly. But if you see the resolution which they passed, the definition of the issues is very environmental. Land degradation, atmospheric pollution, ozone depletion, et cetera, et cetera. These are about eight items listed. They're essentially environmental items. Uh, and the first organization committee organized two working groups which put the, the baskets were essentially environmental. Uh, sort of atmosphere, et cetera, in one, chemicals and water in another group, you see. The conference got transformed in Nairobi, the first substantive prep form. And the way it got transformed was that uh, there was a little window 
which where there was a reference in the resolution to say it should be looked at from a developmental perspective. So the G77 then proposed a portmanteau resolution, uh, listing uh, the, all the classical north-south issues uh, in that portmanteau resolution. And essentially, that was the basis on which, in the end, we ended up with a conference which was as much about development. If you look at the structure of Agenda 21, it talks about poverty, it talks about trade, it talks about sustainable consumption. Uh, and yes, there are environmental programs, but there are also a lot of developmental-based programs. It talks of sustainable livelihoods, of combining poverty eradication and resource management in a framework, which I understand uh, your president spoke about in her presidential uh, address. Uh, there were some difficulties in how the international economy should be, you know, the, uh, could, should be uh, uh, organized, but in the end, the U.S. agreed to a surprisingly explicit statement about declining terms of trade, outward flow of resources, and other terminology. There was also some concern from the Latin American and Caribbean group about human settlements. It was not there in the original draft. And it was Enrique Penalos, another dear friend who is no more from Colombia, uh, the present Penalosa's father. Uh, there was one who's very active now, the mayor, mm -hmm. his father, Enrique. Enrique was the man who really rammed that through and helped us to get human settlements into the um, uh, agenda. Uh, I think I'm not going to go into the details of the negotiating process. Uh, the outcomes, just a few things, just to give you a flavor in, the, uh, in about a few minutes. The outcome, you know, the real principles which everybody swears by now, including the famous common but differentiated. Let me tell you how we got them. There was a negotiating process which was set up, which ran completely aground. We entered the last PREPCOM a few months before the Rio conference in New York, and not a single word of the Rio principles had been agreed. Nothing was about it. Halfway through that PREPCOM, we had nothing. Uh, the PREPCOM was headed by one of the best diplomats I've ever met in my life, Tommy Koh of Singapore. And uh, Tommy Koh then just asked two people, Mukul Sanwal of India and uh, Holte of Norway, just put together a draft. He gave them instructions on what he wanted. And he put together this draft. And on the last day, at somewhere around 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock at night, he presented this draft to the PREPCOM. And he gave a one-hour speech. And he said that you accept this or nothing. If you want the slightest amendment, if you want a comma changed, it's, it's off the table. No real principles. Take it or leave it. Uh, by then, I think partly out of exhaustion, uh, people didn't, nobody, and then he quickly gaveled it. I was sitting next to him. He almost broke my thumb. And uh, he uh, gaveled it. And uh, it was true. There was an Israeli delegate who was sitting there who waved his flag, says, um, Mr. Pre Mr. Chairman, I had asked for the floor before you approved. Tommy Co turns to the man and says, I'm sorry, it has already been approved. You can challenge the ruling of the chair if you so wish, and I will put it to the vote. And the Israeli delegate, of course, knew that he could, there was some language about people under occupation. And uh, he knew that if he had done that, he would not have had more than one vote in favor. So he quietly sat down. And that's how it got passed. It also characteristic of Tommy, incidentally, that after that, he sat for half an hour with the Israeli delegate to explain to him why he had to do what he did, and then mollifying him and helping him out. This was the man's greatness and brilliance as a, as a diplomat. This is how the real principles got done. Agenda 21 was a much more tortuous process of negotiation. I, to trouble you with the, the details of everything would be too much. Uh, it was a massive program, 800 pages. At we started the PREPCOM in New York, people said, well, you'll never succeed. Because most of it was in brackets. And he says, you'll never succeed in negotiating this. And I was under a lot of pressure as the man who was organizing the whole thing. Mr. Desai, I have a th three-page draft in your back pocket as a substitute. I said, 800 pages, three pages, what are you talking? Uh, and my judgment was, that so much polit political capital had been invested in that document by the countries over the previous PREPCOM that they were not going to walk away empty-handed. They would find a way out. I was convinced, but a lot of others were not. And I was under a lot of pressure. I did uh, prepare, but I left it in my hip pocket. And it never came out, never saw the light of day. 
and it, I didn't have to, because by the end of the New York Repcom, 85% was agreed. A few things were left over, which were sorted out in uh, Rio, including the forest principles, which Klaus Stoff uh, uh, sorted out, finance. Many other things I could talk about. I will just leave you with one more, uh, a slightly more delightful episode. Uh, we had some language on family planning. And uh, as usual, there was some difficulty with that, but there is some standard language from the Mexico Conference on Population, which is used in this context. And that is what we used. But there was one, del one ambassador from a Latin American country who kept on holding up, wouldn't agree. So finally, we got uh, some of his colleagues from the Latin American group to tell him that, look, his own government has agreed to this language. Why is he objecting? So they went to him, says, your government has agreed to this language. Why are you objecting? He pulled himself up to his full breath, raises his finger, says, on this I do not take orders from my government, I only take orders from him. <laughs> <laughs> so what did we do? We got his representatives on earth, the Holy See, to talk to him. See? <laughs> uh, this, this is how diplomacy is conducted. I just wanted to give you a flavor of all this. So see, just to uh, tell you that uh, a lot of what comes out, comes out of crazy, uh, uh, you know, chaotic processes of this type, you see. Uh, I won't go into the issue of the climate conference and many other things. Uh, and I would say that many people would describe that what we, through this chaotic process, what we came out with was uh, good. Let me just step back for a few minutes now before I end, to end. And that is, if I look back at what I see as an attempt to connect environment and development in policy making at a global level, uh, how do I understand the politics of this? I've given you a narrative of what happened in the conference rooms and so on. What lies behind the narrative? I'd say that basically governments take, of course, positions, these things are an outcome of power, of course, and governments take positions which are influenced by the domestic lobbies. And we are familiar with some of the pressures at work, for instance, the coal and uh, oil lobby in the United States under George Bush and uh, with John Sununu sitting in the White House. Uh, there were, of course, forest lobbies elsewhere, mining lobbies. I don't think that's the point. I believe what we need to understand are the differences in the nature of the environmental lobbies mm -hmm. in the different countries. If I look at the United States, which has been perhaps the country which has resisted the idea of connecting environment and development more firmly uh, for the longest and continues to do so right now in Rio uh, Centro. If you look at the environmental movement in the United States, it essentially has had two focal points. One is what I would describe as a sort of uh, rom romance with wilderness with the National Park Movement and, and so on. It's certainly the United States has done fantastic things on the National Park Movement. And it has had also a strong uh, position on issues of pollution management. Going back to Rachel Carson's the first uh, act in 1968, uh, the Superfund and so on. And in both areas, the United States has been a little ahead of the curve. But neither of this requires you to re-examine the way your economy runs. You can talk of pollution management as a, in terms of a technological fix, and certainly national parks do not require you to re-examine uh, any of these things. The, there is no serious environmental lobby in the United States which is arguing this case for looking at environmental issues from a perspective, an economic perspective, a developmental perspective. The environmental lobby's focus is that there are a few people like WRI, uh, you know, Climate Works, etc. But they are insignificant compared to the big uh, the other organizations that are focused on wild, you know, wilderness protection and pollution. Europe, on the other hand, I think has had a greater willingness to look at this link. And you see this, for instance, in the European obsession about recycling. In Latin America, it has always been connected, the economy and environment. In fact, the earliest environmental work in the, connected it with uh, the dependency theory, with issues about resource extraction, with issues about trade. In uh, uh, Asia, in developing countries more generally, you, as you could probably have sensed from your president's address, etc., there has always been this understanding that you cannot talk meaningfully about environmental issues unless you talk about poverty and development. That there is no, no practical way in which you can separate 
any consideration of this. So there was not much resistance from that end. There was some resistance in how much do you want to globalize and so on, but not a serious resistance to the idea of connecting these uh, agendas. And I think we need to recognize this. Uh, let me also say that if I may, give you some, to a certain extent, I may be giving you a pessimistic picture, but there have been some positive developments in this the emergence of great um, NGO networks, the emergence, I believe, of much greater corporate interest in sustainability, and of course the emergence of work in the academic sphere of the sort uh, that uh, you have done. Uh, in some ways, but the story has not ended. It's being played out right now in Rio Central, where much to my regret, the US administration is trying, you know, the an Obama administration is trying to roll back language agreed by Bush the elder and Bush the younger. Uh, they will not succeed, but they were trying to roll back. Language on fairness and equity, which was agreed to by the two uh, uh, Bushes. So that, that battle is still going on in uh, Rio Centro. We will get a product out of Rio Centro, which will be reasonably respectable, but way less than what we really need. We are much closer to the brink now, on climate, two degrees is no longer on the cars. It looks as if it's going to be three degrees plus, possibly even four or five degrees. We are transgressing planetary boundaries. And we are, we have nobody who's ready to take leadership here. A hundred plus presidents, prime ministers will meet tomorrow in Rio Centro. I'm afraid not one of them is a leader with any sense of responsibility to the people who are not yet born. This, I'm sorry, is the sad message that I want to end with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that extremely lucid and wonderful um, history of policymakers' history of processes and politics which, are, which existed 20 years ago and before 85 and continue to exist today. I think it's, it's certainly never too late, and I hope we also see this in print, um, this history. Um, may I request you uh, to now take the floor? I'd like to, sorry, congratulate the International Society of Ecological Economics for the initiative, and to salute the members in the, on behalf of Minister Isabella Teixeira, I'd like to salute Bina Agarwal, for the initiative and saying that it's an honor for us being here. When Isabella and I discussed about this event, she, she knew that she, it was maybe difficult for her to come because she has been increasingly involved in the debates of the document of the epic chapter of this long story that Dr. Desai mentioned. And we discussed that that's what we need to reinforce, at least in Brazil. Why? The environmental agenda, the history of the environmental agenda in Brazil has been a history of basically advocacy, command and control, and the fight for creation of conservation units. There's nothing wrong with this history. It's important, it was very, it was decisive for the establishment of the environmental field in this country. But it's not enough for the challenge of the present. We need to move beyond. We need to go beyond this agenda. Here, you will belong to a policy community committed to a long-term perspective. Most of you are academics or practitioners involved in the, in the investigation of environmental economics, which have, it's a field relatively new in terms of the economic deba economics debate. But I have to say that if there's one thing that we need desperately in our policy debates in Brazil is empirical evidence, is critical mass, is proper and decent arguments. We're not talking here just about opinions or impressions. This is difficult because this is a very sanguine agenda. We're disputing values in this debate. We're disputing solidarity between regions, countries, generations. And when we talk about economics, that's not necessarily what comes in our minds. It's, you, all, you all know the reputation of a small science. 
But in order to change this, you need to change the way we produce, we investigate, we teach, and we discuss. We, in Brazil, I like just br very briefly mention some fronts of our ministry. We are discussing forests. It's unthinkable that in Brazil today, we still are in a defensive mode, but we are. We have not been capable of producing proactive, assertive public policies on the economics of forestries. We have achieved amazing results in tackling deforestation. The, the, the government produces extraordinary gains in this field. In terms of carbon, emissions, climate change, the performance was extraordinary, but exclusively based in command and control instruments. And these instruments achieve it its limits. If we don't change what we are doing, it's a matter of time. We will not be capable of sustaining this position over time. Why? Because it's not about keeping nature intact. It's about managing in a sustainable way. No country resigns its possibilities of growth. Now we are discussing the other framework, the paradigms, how to grow, in what terms. But we have a frontier, a development frontier. And President Dilma has been very clear about our objectives. This is a country that grows, preserves, and includes. So if we do not find, if we do not formulate economic develop regional models to develop our regions, especially Amazon, we will face problems, serious problems in the environmental front. This sounds counterintuitive, but it's important to say that there are 25, millions, 25 million people that live in the Amazon, and where and how will they live? They live today from the forest, most of them from predatory practices. And if you want these people to stay there and to promote the development of the region on a sustainable basis, we have to provide them with another model, with another incentives, not just repressing them. So forests, here we have a huge challenge. We need to produce forests. We need to plant. We need to diversify. We need biodiversity in, 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 the natural, in, in, in our new forests. We can't go on just talk, talking about repression. Second front, biodiversity. You know we are one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, as India, Indonesia, Congo, and others. Fine. What to do? How to preserve? How to explore? There's no uh, there's not a good example anywhere about a regulatory framework to explore the resources, the assets of our, uh, of our genetics patrimonial in a sustainable way. So what do we do? We have a legislation that's a shame. It basically it criminalizes everything. We can't go on in this way. We, have a, we need to develop a proper framework, a model, a model that encourages investments that bring the industries to the process and also to reimburse the communities from which this knowledge is somehow extracted in, the, in their benefit. If we do not develop a proper regulatory framework, we, these assets will stay there and will eventually be destroyed because we will not be successful in disputing the case politically of the preservation. Further, Rena, climate change. This has been object of more attention in the recent years, and we are all involved in this debate. But it's not a simple debate. The red market, the carbon market, is not an easy conversation. And it's in our country particularly, we need more knowledge, more empirical evidence, more studies to discuss how to deal with these topics in our best interests. We have participated with China, India, in these the negotiations in, in South Africa, in the basic platform. And what we know and what we understand is an argument mainly put by India, it's a very important argument. 
how can you discuss these issues without taking into account transfers of technology and trade, international trade? These are inter interconnected subjects. On the one hand, we need to treat each topic in itself. We need to scope them in order to analyze them better. On the other hand, we need to discuss these things in an interdependent way, as our negotiators and ministers are discussing in Rio Central. Water. We are naturally granted with an enormous assets in terms of uh, sweet water. Fine. But as we observed in the debates about the forest code, this is a very painful debate. It's very difficult. It's very conflictive. The multiple use of water, this is essentially a, po a politics. When you discuss about agriculture, irrigation, human consumption, nature, we discuss about our interest groups, our history, and our future. All these subjects, they demand information. They demand arguments. They demand empirical evidence. And it's hard to, to provide the public debate with qualified information. Conservation units. We created enormous areas of conservation units in recent years. More recently, we are trying to redefine some of these limits in order to accommodate public investments in the region dams, highways. But what's important to discuss is that these conservation units, they need, we need to explore them in a much more clever way. We need to make them compatible with research. We need to make them compatible with the sustainability of those poor populations, communities who are there, in order to develop a sense of ownership. Otherwise, they will be just paper conservation units, not radio conservation units. If our, co if our society, if our communities don't develop a sense of ownership with respect to our resources, they will be destroyed over time. Licensing. The government developed new mechanisms to treat different sort of investments in a different way in order to modernize the license process. But we need to review our legislation in many ways. Why? Because our legislation tends to treat all investments no matter the scale, no matter the region, in a very similar way. So we need to refine it. We need it more adherent, more suitable to preservation, and at the same time, social inclusion and development. I mentioned these points to, to illustrate the difficulties of building a common narrative when we talk about environmental policies. The environmental debate is very fragmented. And somehow, it's hard to put it in the same basket. When you use the concept of sustainable development, and we try to translate it in the concrete in different places, things get more complicated. And we know that we, ne we have to adopt a more contingent approach, but contingent by articulated approach towards these issues. Otherwise, we will be uh, caught in a trap, and we will remain in the ghetto. The environmental agenda in Brazil does not belong anymore to a ghetto. We belong to the center of government. We discuss with the Minister of Trade, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Science and Technology, most of these issues. This is new, and this is very important. Because if we do not achieve the center of the government decision-making arena, we will, not be, we will not be vindicated in this sense. These debates are not simply translated in terms of our, po our poli political arena. As you observed in the, code, in the Forest Code discussions, the, the polarization is much more appealing than a more qualified debate. In the qualified debate, the middle ground is, in many ways, the way forward. We have to discuss with business, with poor, country, with poor communities, much in a much more intensive way than we have done in the past, not just within the environmental policy community. Last year, during the public activities with respect to the Forest Code, the social movements put 50,000 people in the Esplanada of Ministerios in Brasilia. The first demand of the rural social movements was, we want more green in our properties, in our land. 
we need, we, we, we need to tackle deforestation. This was the Marcha das Margaridas, the women bringing the green agenda to the president, who was surprised. Yes, but why? Because there's an increasing cons conscience that if these are the, one of the, as well as land, one of the critical challenges of our social movement in the field. Capacity building depends heavily on empirical evidence, on knowledge, on qualifying people, on the production of investigations, of arguments. We need to qualify our debates. We need to understand our trade-offs. We need to make public our dilemmas. Otherwise, we will not understand what we are discussing. The environmental debate has been a debate, at least in Brazil, heavily disinformed, misinformed. Real prosperity, when people ask about if will it be a success, for us in the ministry, in many ways, it has already been a success because we never discussed the issues of our environmental agenda as we have discussed it now. If you, you who are participating in some of the events here, you can see that in business people, NGOs, International companies, governments, provincial governments, local governments, individuals, young people, we are all discussing several issues with a degree, with a quality, which is really surprising, which is revealing that the population wants to know more, wants to understand more and better what are the choices we have ahead in order to influence in these choices. In order to conclude, I'd like to say that uh, I, come, I don't come from the environmental policy community. My professional history comes from much more, not, not how would you say, boring issues. Public management, civil service, state reform, this sort of stories. But I have to say that the environmental arena, agenda, has refreshed politics and policies in many ways. And this is, uh, these are good news. We are discussing again our interests, our future, our, our, our way of living in a way that politics was not addressing in the, in the, for many years. And when, this, when discussed today, habits, culture, values, that's what politics is about. And as a, an African guy mentioned in another debate another day, maybe you have to introduce a four pillar in this story. Economics, social, environment, and politics. And politics today is the politics of the environmental policy agenda. And you here who belong to a very recognized and reputed policy community, academic network, you have a huge contribution in this debate. Because if you know our politicians or our practitioners or our media, you, you know how, how they need to interact with you and how we need to, understand, to learn how to speak a language in order to ensure proper political communication. The environmental agenda today faces a problem of political communication. If we do not communicate, we will not succeed. And it, but with the content of this communication depends heavily on people like you here and from your work in order to contribute to qualify these discussions. On behalf of the Minister Isabella Teixeira, who is an academic, a practitioner, and a politician, I welcome you and like you to have an excellent journey here in your meeting, in your participation in Rio Plus 20. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things which came across very strongly, and this was, uh, you know, and, and uh, it leads me to pose a question to both, and then we open up the floor, was uh, the point that uh, Mr. Desai made, which is uh, why that in the United States, for instance, the environmental lobbies are divided and they're all focused on particular things, but they haven't converged. And this is, of course, the issue of collective action um, and uh, whether your intra differences are greater than your inter differences. Um, and this is, this is a lesson, of course, across the globe um, in terms of academics, but it's also a very important lesson for policy. So the question really is in the context of Rio Plus 20 is whether the BRIC countries and which countries would be able to come together to prevail um, and uh, take the agenda forward in a more optimistic direction rather than in the direction in which some countries might be pushing it? Um, do you think uh, there will be a convergence 
uh, at least uh, among the developing countries and especially the BRICS. So um, if I may pose that question to both of you and you, then we open it, open it up to the give you a more <laughs> Okay. I think the big countries are not the part of the solution, they're part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, this is a reality. You see the, the if, you, if I see the negotiations, who stands in the way of strong agreement in the climate process? It's the big countries, not the small countries. No, BRICS. The BRICS also are all big countries. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> the BRICS are all big countries. They are, they're all part of the same process of resistance. I would say that there have been arguments. Say, oh, the UN is too big, 180 countries, how can you negotiate, leave it to the G20? I said, for God's sake, don't do that. Because the G20 is the source of the problem. They are the ones who account for the greater part of our problems, and they are the ones who are resisting action on these problems. And it's really because I have a UN process where at least the voices of the smaller countries, the island countries, the poor countries, the least developed countries, the African countries, can be magnified and amplified that we can get something. So my argument is that don't, don't count on the big countries, the BRICS or OECD or whatever. Uh, you have to have a process which empowers the people who are suffering from the absence of integration. And these are small countries, smaller people, poorer people. I don't know who watched the news today in the morning, but I was happily surprised to see Minister Guido Mantega saying that, okay, the BRICS will organize a fund to provide flow of resources for, uh, for them in case of crisis, but they did it in a way as a supplement, not as part of the IMF package in order to keep their distinctive force, strength in this process. I think that Dr. This Professor Desai has reason saying that in some way, part of the solutions are not there. Some are. We, have, we can't be naive. Technology is especially there in the North. And I don't think we should be very divisive in these matters. But we should know that we have to look for solutions for those who want to contribute to solutions. It seems obvious, but it's, it's not so simple. When you look to what happened from Kyoto, Kyoto until now and the way ahead, we see that what China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, which is a kind of more complex partner, what, 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 what these countries define for themselves, per definition, to influence everybody. When you know the media, they, they measure the success of an event by who attend. When they heard the news that uh, Angela Merkel will not come, David Cameron will not come, Obama will not come, it's okay. They are not the main players in this process. They are important players. But in terms of where, the, where nature is, they are not the major players anymore. Obviously, not different countries have different positions, and we can't generalize the position of a society because of a circumstantial government. But we have to say that what India, Brazil, China, South Africa say today, it's a more important voice for all of us, fortunately. We open it up to the floor. Um, put your hands up, uh, take the mic, and please introduce yourselves and keep your comments and questions short. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. We'll collect about four questions at a time. We have time. Hi, my name is uh, Fabian. I'm, uh, I'm from Brazil. I work here in Brazil uh, as a market researcher. Um, my question is for um, Mr. Gaetani, but I think both both panelists um, may reflect on this. Uh, I was a little puzzled by your uh, suggestion that um, we, we have to work a middle way and that yeah, you're very welcome or very receptive to uh, the input from uh, the academics and the research community. But uh, when it comes to some examples, I know not all of them under the control of the Ministry of the Environment, um, this doesn't quite match reality. For example, with the new forest code, um, the, all the, uh, the recommendations and suggestions by the research community, uh, the, even uh, physicists, chemi uh, the, the chemistry community, uh, economics, were completely ignored. 
uh, and uh, and of course this is part of responsibility of the Congress, but the, the government didn't pay much heed to that. Uh, the same when it comes to trying to conciliate growth with environment, and you have, for example, in the in the in the field of uh, renewable energy, uh, there's no much effort from the side of the government to uh, try to develop. Uh, wind power manufacturer solution or installment equipment uh, uh, policy. Uh, everything is imported from other countries and there's not much prospect that it will be different. So how does, uh, how, how these issues square with your view uh, of uh, integration of the research community and, you know, uh, going, walking the middle way? But there, can, I, can I see the hands again, please? Um, we could bring them there and just, just move across the room, uh, the hand there, yes, in the middle. So we'll take four questions. Um, go ahead, and please keep it brief and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Gator Halpern, and I'm a student from California. My question is also for Mr. Desai. I'm wondering, with your experience in the global government, government governance background, whether you think that the summits such as Rio Plus 20 and the other world summits from around the world um, really will be able to bring about any change. Because from my perspective, I've seen a lot of talk about change in the future and whether or not organization, organizations such as Rio Plus 20 or the Kyoto Agreements or anything have really done anything in the past, and I'm wondering if you think that uh, conferences such as these can actually make a change and bring about an optimistic future. Um, two more questions. Um, straight down, uh, horizontally, on the same row, this side, just at the back. Yeah. And then we'll move forward. My name is Anthony Friend. I'm from Canada. I just wanted to, the question I want to raise is one of a paradox because I was in the London conference called the, um, the Planet Under Pressure. And these were scientists. The scientists were not talking about countries. They were talking about the whole Earth. And they referred to this concept. I didn't hear it at this meeting, but I've heard that, but it was mentioned over and over again about what they call the Anthropocene, which is a, in terms of geological time, they were talking about the human being and what is happening in the very large issues that are, we are facing, and country boundaries are irrelevant to this issue. And I was wondering whether you could comment on the fact that the scientists perceive the problem very, very differently from the politicians and from basically us social scientists as well. Thank you. Uh, one more question, we just, the gentleman here. There is a lady there, yes, just next to, um, just Eva, here. Thank you. <laughs> You're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Eva Larsson from Sweden, uh, not so small country, but uh, less inhabitants, nearly nine millions, but we are a monk culture country because we have friends from all the world who has moved to Sweden. We're happy for that. Uh, you say, uh, you say that uh, it's difficult to talk about environment in U.S. without talking about poorness and catastrophes and illness and whatever. Um, matter of fact, it's the same situation in U.N. when we talk about women. We talk women as the losers, the poorest, because we are <laughs> general. Uh, the, the women uh, we need to help. We not talk about the women as a key opener for result, a key opening for key opener for ongoing transition. What do you say about that? Questions, I'll pose them. Uh, would, you, would you take them and then Mr. Desai? Thank you very much for the questions. I'll try to address the, the three, the fourth, I think it's more specific to Lord Desai. With respect to the two points you mentioned, the forest code. 
The president suffered two defeats until now in her government. And she lost with, we, she lost with us in the ministry. She lost in the house. And we are very proud of our position. It's a balanced position, and we managed to achieve results relatively uh, substantial in terms of, of Brazilian politics. Because we live in a democracy, as you know, and we live in a coalition, go we work in the context of a coalition government. The president suffered publicly two defeats in the House, and twice she managed to revert the results in the Senate, in the, with the veto, the partial veto, and now in the third, the, the tie break with the provisional measure. This is real politics. This is not wishful thinking. The academic community, I don't understand why, what you're saying because our main negotiator in the Ministry of Environment belonged to the academic community. And he was very influential. In the last minutes, the, the decisive contribution of academia was very important for the, for the final position of the president. She heard a lot. You can, we can compare that we didn't achieve the results we aim it to. This is not the ideal code for us, but it's the possible code, and it's the, the, the code that the Brazilian society, democratically speaking, is choosing. It's important to say here that this debate about the forest code has been driven by the productive forces, rural, agriculture, etc. But interesting enough, why are they doing it? Is the current code a good thing? Even if it's not, why didn't we change it before? Why we had to dispute as we disputed it in, to achieve the, the current situation? So let's analyze these things in a more deeper way. This is not about bad guys and good guys. This is about our country. So the academic community influenced a lot the debates all the time. And we lost it in the House, we balanced the game in the Senate, and we think that we achieved a reasonable balance in the current provisional measure. That's our position in the government. It's not my, my dream, but that's reality. With respect to energy, very important question. And I have to say that it's much more difficult to, to answer than the previous one. Why? The history of our energetic metrics of our energetic choices. It's a history commanded by the main, some of the main drivers of our economic development. In a coalition government, you don't have somebody here which, oh, this is the government and there is the market. No. It's a ministry commanded by a complex interaction of interests. And the way we are handling these interests is complicated and we are not being successful in coordinating our choice with respect to energy in a proper way. Because the struggle is not simple. Ethanol, biodiesel, oil, dams, solar, um, wind. Wind, wind, yes. What I can say from our, uh, nuclear, sorry. Um, from our perspective, the Ministry of Environment, we, we are implementing now the Climate Fund, which is implemented by BNDES, and we have some voice in, the, in commanding the allocation of resources in this fund. As you know, the Ministry of Environment is not a, a Ministry of Big Investments. But we are trying to induce in this fund, especially windy, solar, and biofuels in a more ecologically friendly way. We, we managed to achieve better interest rates with BNDES. A part of the resource is non-reimbursable. It's for, it's basically grants. So in the scope of our possibilities, we're trying to tackle this challenge, which is what's a much high, bigger challenge than of the Ministry of Environment agenda. And I have to say that it's a challenge to our history. It's not a matter of exclusive of the government of the day. Here in Rio, we have probably the biggest uh, center of expertise in energy of the, of the country, COP at UFRJ. 
And this is a very compli compli conflictive debate, and we have to face it. We have to process these conflicts. So I think it's a very well welcome point. The point about change. The fact that we are not seeing change does not mean that they are not happening. And I have seen change in many different areas in the environmental agenda, especially in the business sector and especially in the social movements. Environmental claims, environmental arguments are now part of the DNA of the debate. They are not something external, apart. They are more and more part of the decision-making process of social players. And the government is changing, but it's changing after a long time in which the environmental agenda was something uh, outside. Also because some of the people that were in the environmental ministry were behaving as if they were not part of the government of the day. This stigmatized a lot the environmental agenda. The third point about scientists. We need desperate scientific activities, research, positions. But science also, they need to interact more, more intensively with politicians, with policymakers, with people. Otherwise, the fruits of their work will not benefit any players. This is a complicated story. It's not trivial. And we, ha we in this country, we, are we have to pay tribute to many players of the international cooperation, especially Germans, British, Norwegians, they, and from other nationalities, not only in terms of allocating resources, but in terms of producing good science and showing us the assets we have here work with us in terms of co-producing knowledge. In the context of international cooperation, the debate is not more about north-south, but it's co-production of knowledge. And scientific activities in the context of our research and development process have been very decisive in order to help the environmental agenda to be taken into account more seriously by government decision makers. I'd just like to finish saying that your work is one of the best hopes we have in terms of improving the quality of our environmental policies. And back to your first question, Gov the government of Brazil has some bottlenecks that we have to overcome in order to intensify our partnerships with universities. The rules of the game do not favor it, and we have to improve it. This is not a problem of the Ministry of Environment. It's a problem of the federal government. And uh, as soon as we, are, we, we tackle this challenge, we have to work closer in order to achieve better results. We need tension. We need contradiction. We need conflict. We need to process our differences. And in order to do so, we need to stay closer to the university. But these are some things that governments have difficulties in dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me take the last question first. Uh, in some ways, I would say that uh, the environment issue provided that link. Um, one of the things I uh, will have some, take some pride in is that Rio was one of the first conferences where the women's group started participating in a conference which was not a gender conference. Otherwise, still they end up in focusing on the gender conferences. But in Rio, they participated in a conference which was not on gender. Second, their contribution from organizations like Vido at that time headed by Bela Habsuk was not just on injecting the gender dimension. They were a great source of support on all issues. <clears throat> so in that sense, I think we've already started that process. And I today never don't even think of organizations like Vido as, as being women's organizations, but as organizations which are very constructive and helpful in the broader agenda. Let me take the others as a linked set of uh, questions. Yes, I tend to, <clears throat> I do have doubts about uh, the, the value of uh, these big summits. Uh, I would say that what we probably need now <clears throat> are harder agreements on very specific, more focused 
sectoral areas, but not too narrowly defined. I would suggest climate and energy as one cluster, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem management as a second cluster, food security, land and agriculture as a third cluster. But more than that, I increasingly feel that we need to bring back into our thinking, policy thinking, uh, you know what Lewis Mumford and the others used to call the regional planning approach, not regionalism in a narrow sense, but you know, the deeper sense in which uh, Mumford talked of regionalism. Think, you can't build your cities the same way the world over. I shouldn't be building my cities in the driest parts of India with water and sewerage, exactly the way you build cities uh, in a place where water is not scarce. Uh, regionalism in that sense, something which has greater respect for regional constraints, regional specificities, regional priorities. And the question I would pose is, do we have a world system which is capable of doing that? Which is not McDonaldizing the world, but allows slow foods to survive, you know? Uh, uh, that is one of the challenges, because part of our problem is this identical view that, uh, of development. The same thing being repeated in terms of modes of production and consumption the world over. And I don't know what the easy answer uh, to that is. I think, yes, there is a problem of uh, the country framework, which somebody implied, that you know, we are facing planetary constraints. How are you going to handle this if you're going to look for agreements uh, at a country level, amongst national so uh, naturally sort of sovereign, uh, sovereignties? This is the problem of global management and global governance. It's not going to come that easily. Uh, yes, it is true that our structure of political governance has not kept pace with the growth of both ecological and economic interdependence. And we're always struggling to find ways around that. What I think has happened, and that is important, is the emergence of a global community through non you know, the networks of non-governmental organizations, through networks of academic organizations like this. And this is very important. And a very important part of these global summits is to provide a space for these networks. They need to have something where they can then inject their ideas into a political process. And I think part of what I see as our work in the UN is to provide this space for what is I would loosely describe as an emerging global civil society. Down the line, maybe in my grandson's days, you will have something which is a little bit stronger. My final thought, also connected with what you were raising about planetary boundaries, is on the academics uh, input side. We are facing a situation where we are asking governments to act as on a precautionary basis. I'm telling governments do this not because it is happening, but it is going to happen. This means you're heavily dependent on reliable science. And this is happening again and again and again. You're facing this not just in global conferences, you're facing this in day-to-day -day decisions, for instance, on BT Brinjal, or uh, you know, on, 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 on any, anything involving that. And I think we need a process of, of, if you like, a structured process, first, for a certain amount of consensus building in science, Second, of connecting that consensus building with decision making. We've tried this in the case of climate with IPCC and UNFCC. We are about to do this in the case of biodiversity. But looking at the planetary boundaries work which was presented in the Planet Under Pressure, and I participated in the meeting which was held here by Johan Rockstrom and the others, uh, I think we may need to do more of this in, uh, in other areas. So my thought is, in a sense, a connected thing that, yes, uh, we need to be more precise, more sectoral. I think we may need summits in order to provide a space for global civil society. We must increasingly focus our efforts in strengthening these networks, global networks which are emerging, in the hope that down the line they will lead to a different form of global governance from the sort of nation-state-based form that we have uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. time for another round of questions, regrettably, but I'll say a few words because I, putting aside my hat as chair and putting on another hat, uh, to say three things in relation to some of the questions which are raised. Um, one was the issue of women and gender that I remember very strongly uh, in 1992, that Morris Strong's statement, um, there was, the role of women was absolutely central. 
uh, in that, and it was a, a substantial statement. I think there is a shift in the way in which we think about women's role, however, because as I recall, Morris Strong's statement drew a lot from the ecofeminist perspective that somehow women, by being women, bring a special um, perspective to the issue of environment. Where we've shifted is that there's substantial scientific evidence um, which recognizes uh, that it's not something intrinsic that women bring, but the way in which they're located within material reality. There could be differences between classes of women, there could be differences between rural and urban women, and so on. And I think that scientific basis is what probably we will see in um, the, uh, the um, uh, forums um, uh, in Rio today, which is plus 20, where the gender question is still important, but the way in which we think about it is, uh, recognizes the much more nuances and much more complexity. Um, I was also there in the Planet Under Pressure conference, and I think this question has been raised in several of the plenaries, uh, which is about the scientists and somehow not talking to the others. My impression of Planet Under Pressure was quite the opposite, which is for the first time in London in March, scientists and social scientists actually sat in the same panels and talked to each other. And there's different aspects of science. So when Ostrom, Ellen Ostrom, who was one of the um, you know, moving figures of the Planet Under Pressure Conference, talked about science, she was not just talking about the natural sciences, but she was also talking about the scientific tenor that we bring. That is, our policy must be based on evidence. And I think that is where um, the issue of where scientists were then faced with the idea that we know this from science, but how do we translate that into policy is through social institutions to look at financial flows, uh, to look at what the economics of things are. And it seems to me that in the corridors of those 3,000 plus people, we did begin a dialogue which could prove to be quite fruitful. Um, and finally, um, I want to reiterate some of the uh, issues which have come up uh, also in the last plenary, which is that technology and renewables is important, but we think, seem to talk about solar and wind and hydro um, as technologies and renewables. But what also is important in our choices is how do the poor and the poorest, are they able to access these? both in terms of costs, in terms of market access, in terms of non-market access. And the issue of linking renewable energy to access is very, very important because then which form of energy and what way we deliver it could change. So we remember, if you remember, I tried to talk in my presidential address between the choice between um, large dams to deliver water for irrigation versus rainwater harvesting systems, which are doing it at the community level, or again, large hydro projects versus uh, small hydro projects, and what mix we need to take. I did want to bring this back because it's something Sunita Narayan uh, and uh, Nemo Bassi also emphasized um, yesterday. Uh, which is uh, the critical importance of looking um, at our choices from the perspective of access. And this is also both our speakers, I mean, um, uh, did emphasize, um, which is linking um, the uh, linking technology and people, linking uh, institu uh, you know, uh, uh, societies like ours, which bring in the, so the social science and the economist perspective, but a heterodox economics and ecological perspective uh, to science, but also we root it in, in what the Brundtland Report uh, tried to say in 1985, which is what matters is uh, also uh, the issue of equity and poverty and um, the faces of grandsons which, we, which keep <laughs> appearing in your, in your iPad and I'm sure keep appearing in the iPads of many people uh, in this uh, audience. Uh, so, um, with those words, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sorry about the people who had raised their hands, I hope you'll be able to ask those questions. Um, you're, we are still here, you have to leave, but you're here till 1.30 uh, to ask those questions uh, outside this hall. So, thank you all, and thank you very, very much for our two very distinguished speakers. <laughs>